Alrighty, Cherubs. So today we're going to be talking about the Pacific Islands, uh, Oceania, and we're going to be discussing them briefly. There are multiple pieces to talk about, and then we're going to review them uh, next week when we come back. We'll grab the pointer. So it's important to know that most of the Pacific Island art that we're going to be looking at, much like the art of Africa, a lot of it is going to be from the 19th and 20th centuries for the exact same reasons, is that, that it's not going to be made out of um, wood and other non-durable materials, things that don't last, especially in tropical regions. So um, the art that we're going to be seeing today is generally pretty new-ish, okay? Uh, things to know uh, about the Pacific Islands is that they are going to be made by specific uh, genders, that uh, the task of creating certain things are is going to fall to certain genders. Um, wood is going to be carved by men, generally, and softer things are going to be made by women. Uh, linear, look for intricate linear designs um, throughout the region. And again, um, this is a whole vast swath of the planet, kind of like Africa, where we have different cultures. There are some visual unity throughout, like there was some visual unity in Africa, but very different cultures with different ideas and different aesthetics. So just keep that in mind. Uh, giant stone works are unusual. So also keep that in mind. Okay. So we've got a city. We've got giant stone statues. So we're going to knock those two anomalies out of the way. And then we've got a cape, a couple masks, a couple gods, a couple utility figures, a Western style painting and a performance piece, all right? So you can see that Oceania is broken down into different areas, different groups. We've got Micronesia, the islands of Micronesia. We've got Indonesia over here, Papua New Guinea, Melanesia, Polynesia, and New Zealand and Australia, all right? So our first piece that we're going to look at is from Micronesia. All right. And this is the city of Nanmadol. Now Nanmadol is unique in that it is this, um, it was a stone city. Okay. Generally it is not, they're not going to be building cities out of stone in, um, the Pacific islands. This is the exception. Now check out the date. So this one's going to blow out everything that I just said. Okay, so it is 700 to 1600. So this was the capital of a large region, a large swath of land and islands in the Pacific for 500 years. Um, and while it was settled earlier, it became this enormous city um, for 500 years. Okay, now you look at the style of the stone work that's left, okay? And you can see it has this, it's, it's curious. What's happening here, let's scooch ahead here. It's made out of, they've found these prismatic um, basalt rocks and they were harvested and used uh, as building materials. So they would layer these so again, they would harvest these naturally occurring uh, basalt columns and use those and layer them to build up the city, okay, which is really, uh, really unique. And we've seen no one else uh, do that. Um, and really quite beautiful, actually. Nanmadol is shaped like this with a whole bunch of canals and it's shaped with uh, walls around to break the, the tide, okay? It's a royal residence. So if you think back to the other royal royal residences that we've seen, like Machu Picchu, like Yakshitlan, like Tenochtitlan. Um, and what's gonna happen here, again, it's a city built on these small uh, islands 
And part of the city is residence and part of it is uh, ceremonial, just like the other royal residences that we've seen. So the king is going to live here and the court. He's going to have the court live here in the city with him so he can keep his eye on them. And we're going to see that later when we get to Versailles, that the king of France is going to do the exact same thing, where he builds this massive palace and says to the whole court, um, you have to live here in this palace with me so I can you know, keep an eye on things uh, and make, keep your friends close and your courtiers closer, I guess. Um, so the city, the layout of the city itself, though, is much like Tenochtitlan or Venice in that it has these canals that would be navigatable by boat. OK, and the, the shape of the city itself was done to be and you can kind of see how the walls kind of curve up to be like the prow of a ship. OK. So this is non module and we'll watch clips when next week. Okay, so you don't have to worry about those today. Just know that this is a royal residence here in uh, Micronesia. All right. Um, so we've got 92 artificial islands, about 170 total acres. Okay. The ancient city was the capital of the Sotolaire dynasty. Okay, go ahead and circle that in your notes. The Sotolaire dynasty of Micronesia. Okay, so again, it has that symbolic boat shape. All right. And the walls are, we're talking 15 feet tall and 35 feet thick. That's a big wall. All right. So the city of Nan Madul, one of the wonders of the Pacific Islands. Okay. Here are other royal residences that we've talked about. The Forbidden City, Tenochtitlan, Great Zimbabwe. Go ahead and jot these down in your notebook as far as comparables. We're going to take a look at comparables for all of these pieces. So have your notebook ready and have your pencil in hand. And we're going to be jotting down again um, comparables for all of these pieces. Okay. Now our next piece is all the way out here in Rapa Nui. Okay. Uh, what today is known as Easter Island. And it's called Easter Island because it was discovered by Westerners on East, by the Dutch on Easter Sunday. Um, we're going to refer to it as Rapa Nui, okay, because that's what it was called by the indigenous peoples. Now, the, the, the Moai of Easter Island of Rapa Nui um, were gods and ancestors that were carved from this one mountain on the island. And the thing about Rapa Nui is that it's the farthest island away from, it's the farthest point away from anywhere else on the planet. Um, ancestors of the population came there um, hundreds of years ago and found it the land good and they found it teeming with with um a new kind of palm the biggest that they'd ever seen and they were super useful for making boats so they settled there and there was an ancient volcano an extinct volcano on the island that had a lake in it so they could farm and from the volcano, then they started to carve out the Moai and litter the island with them. The thing is, is that the Moai became bigger and bigger and bigger down through the centuries. Um, their practices became um, more and more unsustainable and they chopped down more and more trees. And they brought with them, unintentionally, but they brought with them rats. And the rats, having no natural predators on the island, flourished. And eventually, like, if it wasn't watched constantly, as far as growing new plants, um, they were devoured by the rats. Um, 
so building the building the moai chopping down trees to move the moai chopping down trees to make boats and to go fishing uh the rapa nui decimated their island okay and this is one of the examples where an art is taken to the extreme um where they destroyed the land to build these. And then when the Europeans came, the Europeans annihilated them unintentionally at first, but annihilated them with disease. And then slavers from Peru came and kind of took all the educated people. So Rapa Nui is a, is a, kind of this microcosm of like the planet and life. Like what, how do we, what are we doing to the world that we inhabit? So it's a cautionary tale. What are we doing to ourselves? Okay. So the rap, the, the Moai of Rapa Nui become this uh, symbol for how can we, make better choices. All right. The bodies of the statues themselves are the emphasis is on the head, like we discussed with African pieces. They initially had coral eyes. So they initially had eyes that were coral so that they were white. They also had these hats. Okay. These red coral hats that were, um, eventually lost on, on many of them. You can see here the construction of several of these giant Moai that were never finished. They began to be dug out of the mountain. Okay. So these very, very large, they started small and then became larger through the years and kind of became a competition who could build the biggest. We are going to watch some clips about Rapa Nui when we get back. All right. So again, we, they are representing the ancestors, the gods. Okay. They have, they are simplified. They are abstracted. They've got large heads. Um, they do have um, arms, though the arms are small. Uh, there are about 900 of these statues across the island. And most of them face inland. Okay, so again, we'll watch some clips about uh, the Moai and about the culture of Rapa Nui and what happened to them. Okay. Giant stone statues, again, are the exception here in the Pacific Islands. This is really about it. Okay, um, it's not a common occurrence. So we've got uh, the Bamayan Buddhas, the Todaiji Buddha. We've got the Virokana Buddha at the Longman Caves. We've got the Coil Shakwi Stone. We've got the Sphinx and the Lamassu, other giant statues that we've seen. So go ahead and jot these down as well. Okay, our next piece is up here in Hawaii. And in Hawaii, the piece that we're going to see here is the Ahu Ula, the feather cape. Now, there are many feathered capes. This isn't the only feathered cape, but it is a feathered cape. Now, when I originally saw this, um, I thought that it was something like a poncho that you slipped over your shoulders here, and this is the back side, and this is the front. The black is actually feathers as well. Um, so this is the neckline, and this, these two sides, it wrap. So this is all solid. Okay, that black is part of the design. And this is all solid. And then this is the neckliner. It comes around your neck. And then this hooks together up at the front. Okay? So immediately this should be jumping, you know, fireworks in your head. And you should be remembering, oh, yeah, the, the Mexica with the feathered headdress of Motecazoma. Okay? Very similar royal accoutrement here too. Red is going to be a royal color. So the feathered cape, and again, we got my exception here, 1700s. Okay. The 
Ahu'ula is going to be worn for ceremonies and for battles. And it's going to take hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bird feathers to create this thing. But they are going to use these across the island of Hawaii as uh, royal symbols, okay? As well as uh, for protection during battle. Now, the base is going to be made out of coconut fiber with the feathers inserted. So here you could see, oh, excuse me. Here you can see a more complete costume with helmet and sword. And here is the feather cape, um, a feather cape, not the same one, brought together up at the front so you can see what that looks like. All right, so again, made of thousands of birds. This is gonna be worn by men. And it's got that semicircular form. You got about 500,000 feathers with some birds only using seven, producing seven usable feathers. So this is coming from lots of different birds. Again, I don't know the process. I don't know if the birds were, it were killed to get the feathers or if they were just plucked, I'm not sure. All right. Royal, other royal accoutrements that we've seen though, the golden jade crown, the baptistry of, uh, or the basin, Baptistry of St. Louis, the Pyxis of Almugira, and the feathered headdress. Okay. Excuse me. Now, moving on to the Cook Islands. This is a staff god. And what this is, is it's a carved deity. So he's give, been given a face and some anthropomorphic features and is connected to a staff, the sacred element, that then runs down the center and terminates in uh, a third element that's going to be down here. Inside is going to be, the, the wrappings are going to be what's called tapa. It's a bark cloth, okay? And tapa is um, made from the bark of, of certain trees, breadfruit and coconut trees, and pounded together until it makes this um, fabric that gets painted and decorated. And we're going to see an example of that later. And next week I'll show you, I'll bring out, I have some tapa and we'll bring it out and uh, you can uh, take a look at it and, and touch it. <clears throat> and it's actually very soft. It's, it's very soft. It's a lot softer than you would think it is, but it, it uh, is made across the Pacific islands and they use it to wrap the sacred element of the um, staff god, okay? And within it are going to be treasures. Now, this one that we're looking at is, in fact, rare, okay? Here's the, here's the top element, the carved anthropomorphic features. So you can see how the god, again, has these closed eyes, very stylized mouth. It's almost like the lansone in that it's this kind of knife faced it comes the face comes to a point so it looks very similar to me to the to the lansone in that way um that it, it has that shape now this is a lot bigger than you think it is um let's click ahead okay so here is they're working on uh restoring preserving this one staff gun so you can see that it it's quite large Okay, this isn't like a like a broomstick here. This is this is big. The thing about the staff gods coming from the Cook Islands is that they were um, when the Europeans came, they converted the locals to Christianity, and um, so they considered the staff gods the indigenous gods to be idolatrous and had them destroyed purposefully. Um, so there's actually very few intact staff gods. Many of them were, they just chopped off the, the top element and brought it back as like a souvenir. Okay. And then they unwound the, and pulled out the, the stuff from inside the wrappings and just kind of let it discombobulate. 
So the third, so these two pictures uh, AP wanted us to see, to see a complete staff god as well as the close-up of the, the top element. Okay? And this is an engraving that AP wanted us to see in association with this. Okay, it's an etching that is a print that's coming, um, that was made in the 19th century. Okay, so here you can see the Europeans um, sitting on chairs. They're bringing on um, to them a staff god. All right. And they're going to throw it down at their feet and discombobulate it and desecrate it. Okay. You can see the European style buildings here in the background because that one of them is a church that they have set up. Okay. And the script that you see at the bottom, the text is from the book of Isaiah. And it says, and the idols he shall utterly abolish. So they believed that they were doing God's work by converting these in, uh, the indigenous peoples to Christianity and squashing their fake traditions. Um, history remembers it a little bit differently in that they gave up their culture, they gave up their identity, they gave up their... So we're not even really sure about a lot of elements about the staff gods because a, they mostly don't exist anymore and B um, the traditions have been lost okay so imperialism all right so it is a deity and it would have had this you know upright in the in the village center okay Other male deities that we've seen so far this year, Apollo, remember the Etruscan Apollo, uh, the Lansone. I think the Lansone's a good comparable. Uh, we've got Helios, Dionysus, and the horses. Okay, also. Now back in Micronesia, Nukuoro, in Nuku'oro in Micronesia, we've got the female deity. Okay, now you can see that the the deities, the gods, were thought to inhabit over here in Micronesia, were thought to inhabit wooden statues uh, on special occasions. And they would be dressed. Okay, now you can take a look at her. And she's very, very stylized. Very, it looks like modern art, like cubism. Okay, um, what this pointed almond shaped head these elongated torso this pubic triangle and these kind of short legs all right so in a way she kind of feels like um the oba plaque with an, an long enlarged head elongated torso short legs kind of feels similar to that but much more simplified geometricized um she simplified because she would have been decorated. Okay, she would have worn clothes and flowers, and uh, they would be brought out. They were kept in special uh, temples, and they would have been brought out on special occasions uh, for festivals like the harvest that would have lasted for weeks. Dances would be performed in their honor by both men and women. And so, this female deity here is. Um, one of those objects that is left to us from that time period okay so again she has this serene quality she has this um tranquil quality because again she's not emoting very strongly because she has no features right but it, it presents us with this sense of tranquility but again just these geometric simple geometric forms Other female deities that we've seen, the running horned woman, Nike adjusting her sandal, the Nike Samothrace. Uh, we saw Athena killing Alcyoneus, the giant, at uh, Pergamon. And we saw Coil Shakwi. Okay. So, um, yeah, other female deities that we've seen. Now we're going to go to the Torres Strait in between uh, Papua New Guinea and Australia. 
where we get the book mask. Now this one's going to be made out of tortoise shell. Okay, so it is very rare um, as far as the materials that are being used to create it. I mean, tortoise shell is not uh, this universal mask material. <laughs> okay, so the, we can see how it has this human face, and it's made in multiple parts. So you can see the, like the face plate is a part with the edging. The the rim here is another part. The uh, beard portion is another part. The side of the heads is another part. So you, they have all these portions uh, that have been brought together. Okay. Now the elements, the different elements that are used in the book mask are going to be coming from uh, various different islands. So it speaks to the trade, the extensive trade network that existed at the time. Um, it is topped by a, a bird, a frigate bird. Okay. So we've got the mask portion, the human portion down here, but then it is also topped with this bird with these feathers and these uh, sticks and things. And the wings themselves, as the dancer would move and perform, the bird would shake and flap um, also. So it would move too. So it becomes, again, this animal-human hybrid. And again, we'll watch clips uh, next week. So again, the turtle shell mask is unique to this region. No one else in the world is doing this. They're using grass um, costumes. So like in Africa, how they're going to be using raffia, they're going to use grass costumes. And um, with a variety of uses for this mask. Okay. And again, animal-human hybrid with that bird on top. Different masks that we've seen. We saw the transformation mask in the Pacific Northwest. We saw the Bundu, the Puo, the Aka, the uh, the Emblo, and the Olmec masks. So please jot those down too. Okay. Now to Niue. Now we talked about Tapa. And again, it's this fabric that's going to have different um, patterns on it. And it's called, throughout the whole Pacific, it's called Tapa, except for on this island where it's called Hiapo. I don't know why, but there it is. So you can call it Tapa, and that's fine. You can call it Hiapo, and that's fine. This piece is Hiapo because it's coming from Niue. Um, tapa cloth is going to be again, have this geometric patterning on it and these uh, floral patterns as well. All right, these uh, vegetal patterns. And each, and the symbols are going to be unique um, to the region. And they're going to be applied in different manners too. Sometimes they're smoked on. Sometimes they're painted on with, with uh, plant colors. There's a variety of ways to apply the pigment, okay? And this one looks really, really light. Um, all the tapa that I've seen is darker. It's more of a red, uh, more of a burnt sienna color. This is a very light cream. I've never seen tapa this, this color. And usually it's variegated. It changes its intensity of the redness kind of throughout the piece. And so again, next week when you come to class, you'll see... Uh, what that looks like. See, more, the top of that I've seen looks more like this. Okay, so we got the mulberry, the breadfruit trees, and it tapa is going to be a um, an important gift. You get it; it's brought out for special occasions. Okay, um, wedding gifts. It conveys status um, to the to the to the recipient. And you'd be given large, large pieces of it for, you know, your wedding or for, you know, special occasions um, so that you could bring it out and use it as a floor covering. Other pieces of tapa are worn on certain occasions. Okay, so you would have multiple pieces of tapa and used for um, not everyday wear. All right. So again, the pieces are beat together, pasted together, 
Again, the designs are interpreted symbolically and the images have their own unique history and they change throughout uh, the, the whole Pacific region, okay? Again, we're gonna be worn as clothing before cotton gets introduced. And Tapa is gonna have, it's, it's, a, it's an honor to receive as a gift. Other fabric arts that we've seen, the Altokapu tunic. Uh, we've seen the Artabil carpet. We've seen the banner, the silk banner of Lady Dai. And we've seen the Bayo tapestry. So we've seen several pieces made of fabric that are important to their respective cultures. Okay, And Hiapo Tapa falls into that category. Okay, Now this piece is a Western style painting. This is uh, Tamati Wakanene, and the artist's name is Gottfried Lindauer. He's going to be painting an oil on canvas. Now you can see that Tamati Wakanene was a coming from New, this is coming from New Zealand, um, and he is a Maori chief. So he is dressed in feathers. Um, he has on his face the it's called Tamoko. Okay, a symbolic uh, status tattooing. All right. Initially, it was where it was carved into the skin, and later it becomes tattooing. Um, they hint at this in Moana, you know, in the movie. But on your, the men are going to receive it on their face, um, and other places. The women are going to get it right here on their lips and just below their lips. Okay. And again, it's a symbol of rank and privilege that you would receive Tamoko. All right. Now, Gottfried Lindauer was a Welsh artist coming from Wales in Great Britain. And he came to New Zealand and started painting portraits of the chiefs of the Maoris. And Tamati Wakanene was a chief that converted to Christianity. Okay. And he had already passed when um, Gottfried Lindauer painted this. So Gottfried Lindauer is painting from um, photographs of the chief, right? So you can see he's an older gentleman. Um, he's got his staff, symbol of power and authority, with that green stone. It's almost like an eye here in the staff, hung with feathers. And he, of course, wears feathers as well. Um, Again, here's Talmoko, a Maori specialty. It's going to uh, speak to status and rank. And a carved Maori head with that Talmoko from the Utah Museum of Fine Arts. Okay. So Tamati Wakanene, um, 1780 to 1870, was a Maori chief and he converted Christian. Okay. And he's going to be painting it after the death of, of the chief from photographs. He places that, you know, the eye, or excuse me, the symbols of rank are the emphasis of the, of the photograph, or excuse me, of the painting. And what he's going to be doing this for, the purpose of this painting, is to show Westerners kind of what's happening, you know, who these people are in um, New Zealand. Okay. So this is Tamati Wakanene by Gottfried Lindauer. So art that was presented in a different style. We've got Chairman Mao en route to Anyuan, how it was not done in a traditional Chinese style, how it was done in a Western style. Okay, This is exactly the same thing. Uh, other portraits of leaders that we've seen are Chairman Mao, the Justinian Mosaic, the Alexander Mosaic, the Augustus of Prima Porta, Menkare and his queen, Akhenaten, and the Endop. Okay. These are all portraits that we've seen. Okay. In the Marshall Islands and Micronesia, we're getting this piece. And this piece is very much to me like the Lucasa. Um, it's a navigation chart. And what it is, it's woven. And there are many different examples of these. It's a, it's a 
from the Marshall Islands. Okay. And it, it is a, it depicts the currents of the ocean and the little shells that are tied on our islands. Okay. So it becomes a map rather than a map of uh, specific events. It's a map of locations. So like the Lucasa, then it's studied and memorized and the horizontal um, and the bent pieces represent currents that can be followed to visit different islands. So it's made out of wood so that it is buoyant in case dropped in water, but it is generally not carried on those voyages because uh, they're too valuable. Okay. So they're memorized before leaving. So you, you didn't have to um, take it with you. All right. But it is made of these buoyant materials just in case. Okay. So again, it acts to me like the uh, Lucasa, the memory board of the Luba, the uh, memory aid made out of these natural materials. Okay. The Marshall Islands are low lying. Most of these islands are low lying and hard to see from a distance. So you kind of got to know where they are, just know where they are without having to see them. Okay. Other uh, useful pieces that we've seen, the Merovingian fibula, the Artabil carpet, the basin, the bandolier bag, the Pyxis of Almaguera, and of course the Lucasa. In Papua New Guinea, we're going to be getting the Malagan display and mask. Now this is going to be made um, for and danced and performed in honor of the dead. This is a funeral display. So this is a life-size, I mean, this is a life-size door, okay? When a person dies, a mask is made in their honor and it becomes their soul portrait. Again, not a portrait of their features, clearly, but a soul portrait and is danced in their honor. And a display is set up for them. Ceremonies are performed that um, to send them off to the next life. And sometimes these take months to create, all right? Um, and it's the ceremony that's important. It's not the thing. So after the ceremonies are completed, the living are freed from the obligations of the dead here in Papua New Guinea. So that the living no longer have to, um, in perpetuity, are uh, obligated to, to the dead. Okay. This completes that deal. And then after those, and the ceremonies last for a while, for weeks. And after they're completed, then the display is left to decay on its own and return back to nature. Okay. So it's not preserved. It is not maintained because the ceremony is complete and the obligations of the living to the dead are fulfilled. And that's what the Malagan display and mask is for. So you can see this one again with kind of its fiercer features. This one was for a warrior. All right. And the hair there, the top piece, the coiffure up here is inspired like the, um, Bieri, the Fong piece, it's inspired by hair do. Okay. There's Miss Nicole. Um, they have a Malagan mask in the Utah Museum of Fine Arts. Right. It's on display. You can go walk up and see it. It's very cool. All right. So again, the structures are um, left to decay after the ceremony is complete. Um, they're painted, this particular one is painted with red, black, and yellow, okay? So again, powerful colors to denote that this guy was a warrior, all right? He's got very intricate carvings and the sculpture is, again, it's commissioned and it represents their soul and it's not supposed to be a portrait per se of their likeness, all right? So this is the Mulligan display and mask.
other funerary pieces that we've seen, the Temple of Hatshepsut, uh, the late the banner of Lady Di. All right. Now Fiji is our last piece, and in this, Queen Elizabeth II um, visited the island in the fifties, and she was presented with gifts, uh, ceremonial gifts of tapa and other um, gifts. So you can see here, the tapa is being brought out, mats are being brought out by these women to the Queen of England, who's not in the photograph. But this was a ceremony. This was a, a performance. All right. And this was being performed for her. And so this photograph is kind of an evidence of that. Um, they include this in here as a performance, as an example of performance art. OK, when we get into the 20th and 21st century, you're going to see performance art more where it's not theater. OK, it's ceremony, it's ritual. And in the 20th and 21st century in the West, it's going to be um, the ritual is artistic statement. OK, it's not sacred in that sense of, of uh, local customs. It is um, performance of aesthetic and artistic ideas, expression of those ideas. OK. So this, the, and it's only documented through uh, photography and videography. And so this piece exists in that realm where the performance is come and passed. It was witnessed by these eyes, these human eyes, but then it was documented by photographs and videos as well. Okay. So this is the presentation to the Queen Elizabeth II, presentation of Mats and Tapa to Queen Elizabeth II. All right. Other performance pieces, it's like the Lucasa and all the masks that get performed. Again, their documentation is this physical object that we're looking at, and we can look at it and, and break it apart for its, its formal qualities, etc. But really, it's the documentation of a performance. Okay, and the documentation of this performance just happens to be a photograph. And those are our pieces, okay? I hope that you watch this and I will go through these again next week to see if you have any uh, questions, all right? So these are the pieces for um, the Pacific Islands and I'll see you next week.